going to Beaver Island and we're going to go and cut some ash trees, black ash trees in specific. And we're going to be able to uh, help revitalize the basket making traditions of the tribal members by bringing those ash trees back to Waganukasin, our home area, which you can see in the background here is all along this coast, the higher ground, and then where the ground is lower is Little Traverse Bay. That is where a lot of our people live from that particular location north up through the Waganukasin area. And I've often heard Wasan say that it, some of the older baskets, that when she's holding them, she can feel the hands that made it originally. So yeah, there's there'll be a lot of uh, spiritual connection, traditional connection, and it's part of our culture, and we need to preserve that. So yes, it's very important. If you don't take a careful selection process, you end up working harder or, or doing things that you didn't have to do. Um, and so we'll, we'll be going out in the woods and trying to listen for what the trees have to offer to us and pay attention to you know where they're growing and, and how they're growing um, and where they're growing with. And, and those trees, they have a spirit. And um, we just gotta we just gotta be there to accept them, and, and it'll, it'll be good. It's, it's just good. Well, my mom passed away back in 1990, so I don't have a connection with her anymore. This to me is like, this is coming, it's bringing me closer to the roots of where she came from. Um, so to me, this is, it's like, this is where my heart is, you know? I was pulled to come back here and to learn. And so here I am. <laughs> Just I want to see evenness in the in the uh, canopy. You want to see it green all the way around. It's good to see the branches kind of come straight out because black ash typically have thinner splints, but those branches coming out means that the tree has supported that with thicker growth rings. So that's that's a good sign. Um, and again, it having that spongy bark and flaky bark. You can almost just wipe wipe the bark off there till it's smooth. That's a good sign. <clears throat> the bark will peel off there easy. It's straight. It doesn't have a whole lot of sprouts or nothing down here. There's a little knot. Very few knots. There's one. Oh, it's falling the water. Looks good. Yeah, I would, I would probably want to gather that tree. It's like a swamp ash. I don't know how, there, you see a lot of these. Mm -hmm. You could make baskets out of them, but they're way thick, way oh. thick. And you know that because the, the grain, you can just see the grain mm -hmm. on the outside, um, how it's got like big, there's not grooves, but I don't know what you call that. You know what I'm, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And and that just tells you that the growth rings are thick. And then it having this, so we wouldn't be able to really split any of the splints out of there. But they'll pound up and you can make work baskets and stuff. Like the trees we found over there and then the, the other tree that was too thick over there. You'll find different breeds of tree and then you'll just, you know, over experience knowing, you know, that these are really thick splints in here because of the bark mm -hmm. is, is growing so far out that the growth rings will be half that size, half the, at least half the size of the uh, flakiness of the bark. And it is spongy, so it should split and lift, peel off the tree. 
but they're too thick. Mm -hmm. You see how it leans? Yeah. It leans to one side. It, that means that the growth rings will be a lot thicker on the inside of the lean. They'll be a lot thinner on the outside. So it, it wouldn't help us really to gather that tree. The straighter, the better. The straighter, the better. And, you know. <laughs> this, this being a black ash tree, this is the one we're going to use for baskets. Because the it, it does have some ridges to it, but all this bark comes right off. And it's almost flat. Um, the bark is, is spongy. Um, it's in standing water. There's no EAB because there's no sprouts, no um, split bark, it, there's no dry spots in the tree. We want to take this tree because it, it only has one knot here, the rest of it's straight. Um, it, this is just going to be a good tree for us. To show the creator that we appreciate us coming together and to honor this tree we're going to take it and make baskets um, we just want to take our time and carefully selecting the right tree um, this this is the biggest tree of this stand of ash so what we're doing is taking the best one so we want to say miigwech to the creator to these trees for offering their lives And then I'll clear out a spot. We'll check the growth rings, make sure it's absolutely what we want. And then we'll cut it down. So I'm gonna try and tap it over here because I think it might be thinner over here. And I wanna make sure that they're not so thin that we can't use this tree. If we can't use this tree, there'll be a, um, I'm gonna chop a wedge out and it, it will damage that part of the tree, but it will still live and, and have seed I'm not going to go so low, I'm not going to hit it way down here, kind of up here. When I pulled the axe out, the bark come off and you could hear all the growth rings already, so that's a good sign. What do you think? <gasps> yeah. Look at him. We ain't gonna do much pounding there. Yeah. See how you can see how it's already flaking and it's already trying to pull apart. And the thickness of them. They're they're thick. Can you turn it over? Some are thin. Perfect. But overall. The majority of them are thick enough that, and this this should be the thinner side because it's got a, a little bit of a lean to it. We're looking for a tree with with. Uh, thick growth rings Something that we can split when we pound them up That's a lot better. Oh, yeah, and they're consistent We took a decision out of two trees here and we took the one with the thickest growth rings so that we can split the splints yeah, we're done harvesting for today. We'll take the bark off tomorrow and, and pound the log from one end to the next. Um, the split should come up, come up easy. But we're working in warm weather. So we gotta be patient. <laughs> This 
my first basket. <laughs> yeah, careful, careful. There's little, little ones in there that grip your knuckles. But there's little knobs in yeah. there. You want to go the other way, like yeah. I kiss. Yeah, yeah. Hands down. I'm just, I'm just Hands down, it. because it'll rip your finger. Boy, it's not feeling good. I want to do something. <laughs> And I use an axe because of the length on the head of the axe um, is what we like to split about two to two and a quarter inch splints. And you gotta hit it, you know, like three or four times right in that one spot right on the end and then half the hammer head away every you know so you're hitting it twice but it's got to be hit like once or twice at least and then it'll uh, separate itself from the log those about five or six growth rings at a nickel's width as long as you pound every spot the growth rings won't stick to each other and they won't rip away and they'll just come right up you don't even have to pull it or nothing good black ash would do that for you it's so easy. It's very much easier than what we've done with the red ash where you gotta pound it three or four times in one spot. There's, there's some things that machines still can't touch and they cannot, cannot do it like we do with hand. Is pounding those splints and getting those up the way that they're supposed to that follow the grain there's no machines that can follow grains you know just like our hand weaving um, finger weaving there's no machines that can do that they don't I mean it changes all the time every row would be a different pull under over There's a lot of that knowledge that's here in the woods and we don't know, you know, in a lot of, you know, the medicines like we did before and, and other things, you know, the crafts like that. It's, you know, I'm seeing trees that I could have harvested, but they're dead. And um, it's hard to continue that, you know. is the, the first one, the one next to the cambium. Call it the cambium splint. It's nice and thick. I had a good year last year. You could tell from each one of the growth rings the personality of that tree and what was happening. And I feed it up through here. This All this does is hold it. I bend it off to one side. Use my mokman to cut halfway through. So I can separate six months of growth ring on one side and six months from the other side. Then I hold on to it so I have control of it with my um, ninjis on thumbs. I don't know what you call a thumb. And um, they say that there's no word for it. Oh, is it? Wosna, hold on tight and pull evenly pulling apart the growth rings and I change the angle according to how thick or how thin the growth rings are getting and anytime there's a blemish like this here it'll be a little bit snugget a little bit difficult but you want to keep control of it this is a nice nice thick one that would be good for bottoms eh take a piece of something 
like a piece of jean material or something get that all that stuff that's gonna grow another another growth ring this one is so wet it's not even shaven yet the sound of that splint hear that yeah as it's splitting the motions that I I make when I'm splitting it the smell all of that when I experience that my ancestors experience that and so they come to find out who's doing these old things again and it just it's what I call going into the zone <laughs> next thing you know it's eight o'clock at night and I haven't eaten anything <laughs> and every and the house looks like hell do you know <laughs> splints all over the place you can harvest ash black ash for coco banagan any time of year but in the spring it's special because only in the spring when the there's tons of stuff going on, the leaves and the photosynthesis and, and the sun and they're taking a drink and it's making new wood. There's a lot of activity on the Cambian side of the bark. And so that's why you can take it off there like that. Peeled right off, Wasan. Just, it was no trouble. Isaac and I had it peeled in no time. Right? Mm -hmm. I was surprised at how moist it was. Now you can store a log. Like if we didn't take the bark off it, we could store those logs for maybe maybe up to a year if you bury them in the ground. And then um will keep them nice and moist. So every time we all of these trees are medicine all of these plants There's no such thing as a reckless weed it's all good it all has a purpose even that bug i heard that grandma talk about it on um, wapo island and she's a basket maker their island is wiped out they have no ash at all on wapo and that's a huge basket making community and she said don't cuss that um eab out she said, even though it's foreign species and doesn't belong here, there's still purpose in that, in that creator's creation. You know, in the language, you know what we call a bug? Manadoshas. Small little spirit. Even that bug has a purpose here. So she said, don't, because I used to be really angry at that bug. Like I wanted to, I just, yeah, I was just angry because it was screwing with my life. And then I happened to think about what that grandma was saying. You know what? She's right. It, it is also one of the creator's creation. And she said that bug has come here to teach us something. Let's pay attention to it. So I started really paying attention. The best baskets are woven really tight. And they're woven... Um, with nice even splints. So I'm going to make a quick 12 bottom basket. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about um, what you what you did to prep these just now with the cutting and? Yeah, lots of scraping and cutting to get them even and the right size so that you're not wasting any of the material. I'm a little weird about my my leftovers. And that's because I um, put Sema down, so it's not trash. I, I have to burn it in a clean fire. Um, and all of the ends and pieces, I, I start usually by making bigger baskets because I cut them all to length and or width, and then I'll make bigger baskets, and then with the ends and pieces from that, I'll make the next size down and the next size down. So it's really something to get a big hamper, a big hamper basket, because that's usually the first basket off the log. And then the ends and pieces, you make the next size and the next size. 
basket making is really math. Minoa um, measuring. But my measurements are all on my hand. It's in between here and here, or here and here, or right here, or here and here. You know, I don't use a... That's, that's my measure. That's, those are my measurements for my baskets. That way I don't have to carry a different kind of tool. The most uh, difficult part of creating baskets is um, making the bottom. But once you've got the bottom made, then pretty much your basket is almost halfway done. And then, you know, the very last part that you do with making baskets is the embellishment. But you have to have some idea of what you're gonna do. Jipwa, um, I mean, uh, you have to have some idea of the design before. But, um, Really a good basket maker and knows which splint will do what job. And once you split it, the side that was next to the um, bark is the stronger splint because it was carrying water and nutrients and doing its job and all of that stuff. That's the splint that I like to use um, when I'm weaving to do the tie downs and to hold the handle on and you know, because it has a lot of dexterity so once the bark comes off and you start pounding in the Michigan summer you got about three months to um, finish that basket or finish that log before it dries out so much that you can't work with it anymore so I usually that's the way I did it because I, I did it for a living once I harvested a tree I would pound it and pound it and pound it until it was all pounded to make sure I didn't waste any of it. And that takes, you know, a week or so. Two people working on it. If it's just me working on it, it's probably two weeks. But if there's a couple of us working on it, we can get it done in within a week. It was never meant to be a job that only one person does. That's why I'm just dipping it in there and getting it wet. And uh, when you get it wet, then it, um, that's a good lesson that I probably teach people. Water makes it stronger, not weaker. A lot of times I've gone to collections and seen old baskets and looked at the way that they start them and finish them and stuff like that. And, you know, I just feel so bad because, of course, you got to wear gloves and stuff. And it's like, oh, man, these baskets are so thirsty, you know, but... Because you give them a drink of water, and that the way I the way I think about it, even in English now, is um, you know it reminds them that they're a tree. This is uh, I just sewed in the other six, the first six I went around. I always do my nasa the same way every time. I put my six splints down. This will be the outside of the basket. What I'm weaving is binge, koko uh, binagen, and then I go around three times take that nasa up, um, you know, splint na, and sabapis and shikikwaso, nim ngodwaso, another six I sew down the basic one at a time. And then before the um, bottom is completed on this basket, I need to go around at least two times. I'd like to go around three, but I don't know if this is going to make it. And um, and then I'm gonna. And you see, I'm pulling it really tight, and you can hear that kind of creaking noise. <laughs> that means that it's really tight, and it's gonna hold together. A tight basket will hold together. So this is called a continuous weave. It's the only time you get to do this on the basket. Other than that, everything will be row for row, but it's a continuous weave because I didn't start it and stop it. Now I'm getting ready to 
stop this part here. You can tie it off. I always use the same knot. My uh, John Pigeon, my, my basket brother down south. taught me how to do this cool little knot so I call it a Potawatomi knot and uh, it's just a one-sided square knot and then um, the bottom of the basket is basically done and then uh, I'm gonna start up on the side and I have to crease this everywhere here if I got it if I got these, I got these wet when I first made that initial bend and that tells me where the middle is so I don't waste anything on the edge. Meanwhile, you know, uh, it also um, gives it the strength that it needs to go through all of this bending and stuff and I don't have to get it wet again. Okay, once those are bent up, now the inside of the basket is clearly the inside and the good side, which is the split side, is going to be the outside of the basket. And now all we have to do is basically you get rid of the dope wants. You know, I'm going to make uh, the edge of my basket or the side of my basket when I start weaving. I weave so the splint is showing. Um, because a good basket shouldn't have any of the ends and pieces showing and it's just real basic weaving up down up down up down but it's where your hand needs to know how to hold it that's why I don't do it on top of the table I do it on your lap because that kind of acts like a third hand that holds things together in the proper way um, I'm going to come back around to where that piece is showing I'm going to weave over the top of it and double you know, overlap it now. and then hide it so it's behind this upright like that. And that way there's no end showing on either side on the inside. Every row you put on will hold on the row previous. And so, uh, see that's trying to pop up. And so that's why I go to the left of it so I can weave over it real quick hold that down because this row that I'm putting on will hold that one down because it's just the opposite if I went under this one then I go over it if I go over one under it should be the opposite of the row I just put on so under over under over when put on it's real real easy to do but it's all about uh, you know the designs that you want to put on there and the embellishment if I try and cut this way it's really dry like that it'll just crack and break up so I just so this is this is where the embellishment is going to go and that's why I have a plan of how I want this to work out Yeah, I like that sound. It means that I'm getting it tight. <laughs> you know, I'm getting it squished down in there just the way I, I need it to go. To be able to create a basket and then give it away to the tribe for a raffle or something is my way of paying back my tribe for helping to provide me with adequate and beautiful housing. Let's put that um, last splint on that's going to be my rim. And so now I'm cutting these in such a way as I'm going to bend them down and tuck them in and put my rim on on this basket. And since I'm gonna bend it real hard, I'm gonna get these wet so I don't crack it up. And I'm gonna sew a rim around the top edge of this basket. Put the embellishment on it. 
maybe put my um, what I call the feet. I don't know, it just feels good to weave again with this material. I don't do too much um, birch work anymore. The birch trees are getting harder and harder to um, find healthy ones. They're also affected by the manner in which human beings live. You know, that's just all there is to it. We're affecting them. We'd be doing a lot better if we just weren't around. <laughs> We're, we're hurting the environment and everything we do through our cars and the way we grow our food. You want to hide the way that the basket is put together, right? So I take a kind of measure a piece for the outside and the inside and I use this as what I call my, um, my sewer. This is really tight so it's and I fasten it down take a stitch in between each upright and under that base here that I'm calling the rim and take a couple stitches ahead of time and then I'll put that rim on because there's so much that you have to hold on to I like to do that this way. And then if I've got it, I'll put the weed gush in between there. And it even further hides the, the edge, makes it nice and neat. I say, <laughs> that's one thing about the, thinking about my grandmas and I used to love to watch their hands. I thought they had the most fascinating and beautiful hands. And I'd watch them and I I remember even as a little girl I'd think oh my goodness the things those hands have done you know and I was just all fascinated with it but it was also showing me you know by watching them so close and watching the you know almost like a dance you know the way they use their hands that's what I was thinking about when I was a kid you know I um was learning which way to pull these splints too at the same time. And how to make things tight and the order of the way that goes. Some of my grandkids are old enough to, to handle sharp stuff, like scissors and knives, and some are. So, of course, my goal is to make sure that they all make a basket with me before I leave this world so that they'll always remember that and then I've got a lot of baskets out there in the world and they'll see my artist mark on it you know on my tribe I always put my tribe mark you know it says LTBD on it which means that's where it came from cut it at an angle to hide the way that I took that stitch. Like I said, just like in everything, a good seamstress doesn't show, you know, where they started and stopped and stuff like that. Well, I try and do the same thing with black ash. And so you can't see where the splint stopped. I took two stitches where I ended. So now I saw the same thing. If it's too if it's too dry it'll crack up when I go to cut it. But the good news is you just I'll dip it in the water and then real quick. And so again that's what I'm doing is cutting to get a straight edge. The the first edge and I make it really small. And even these scrap pieces, you know, are discarded in a 
respectful way. Structurally, it isn't doing anything, but it is making it stronger because I'm putting it through here so many times. So this is part of the core wood off that tree. That's why it's a little bit darker. And since I'm not dyeing my splints, that's the only color they're gonna get on this one. And when it, when the ash gets ultraviolet rays, meanwhile, every spring when you wash them off and give them a drink, like I was talking about earlier, um, the patina will turn just a, a little bit darker. It changes it every time. And so that's why um, baskets kind of turn this golden brown color. But these are going to change at a different rate because it already started darker. And so it's always going to have that contrast in there. It'll just be beautiful. Put it off short and wedge this in there. This is done. Now on the bottom, I'm getting all happy because I'm almost done. This is what I call the feet. The baskets, the thing that takes the most wear and tear on a basket is the rim. Meanwhile, the handle and how the handle's tied on and the bottom because you pick it up and put it down pick it up and put it down so much so i'm going to put what i, I call feet on the basket or uh, base of the basket that will keep it from breaking or this will break first and then you'll get many more years out of your basket. So this keeps it, if, if, if I wove a crooked basket, this would help it to sit straight too. <laughs> when I go through the last one, and I go through this way, so it matches up on the other side. Ah, gives you thumb. Now it sits up a little bit because it has this on here. Meanwhile, the rim, the easy curl. Yeah, easy top. In my opinion, this is Wasan's opinion now. In my opinion, when our young people, um, they know something's missing. And so they come and they say things like, I want to learn about my culture. I say, well, you are the culture. What you're doing is your culture. You are who you are. I think what you mean is you want to learn about the traditions. First thing they're hungry for is their language. I think they're really hungry because once they know their language, they'll know who they are and where they fit in the world because it has that place in there. And then all of these other um, cultural traditions will fall in place. But yeah, they're really hungry. They want to do it. 